four, <laughs> three, two, one. All right. So we're here with Tandy Trower. And who are you? I am the general manager, and I can now finally say that I'm the general manager of the Microsoft Robotics Group. Most ah. people probably didn't know there was a Microsoft Robotics Group. No, they didn't. You've been hiding away over here in, in Microsoft Research. We actually are a product incubation, so we're not just, uh, you know, we're not, we're not doing a research project, so. Okay. So what are we going to do today? So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you something about what the Microsoft Robotics Group, uh, Robotics Group, as well as the Microsoft Robotics uh, SDK is doing. So what we're so let me first frame it in terms of sure. what is this all about? What yeah. what is the Microsoft Robotics Group and what do they do? So we have been working for the past several months on a software development kit. Everybody at Microsoft knows what a software development kit is, and we've published so many of them, so many people outside know what they are. So what we've done is we've created an application development environment for the robotics community. Who in the robotics community? Everybody in the robotics community. We okay. like people who are novices, we like people who are hobbyists, who are researchers, commercial developers. In fact, in our announcement um, that we're making, we, we have support, uh, we have a uh, supporting endorsement from uh, Soren Lund, who is the, uh, the, the lead of the Mindstorms group at LEGO. And we also have uh, a statement of support coming from KUKA, who is the uh, um, uh, the uh, lead one of the lead companies in the industrial automation area. So our what we're doing actually applies across the whole spectrum of who's there. Okay. So what's in the the SDK is actually three primary areas of software. Mm -hmm. The first one is our runtime. And a runtime does a number of things. I've already mentioned one of them, which is that we have a scalable architecture that allows you to address robots of, from everything from small 8-bit robots all the way up to 32-bit robots. So industrial okay. robots, toy robots, anything. The architecture we have will apply to a variety of different robots. It also has a very nice uh, concurrency library, which you guys at Channel 9 already featured. Yeah, the CCR. The CCR, yes. This is a piece of technology that, as you know, was incubated over in Craig Mundy's group. Uh, very powerful piece of technology that makes running concurrent, creating concurrent applications very, very simple. Mm. Um, as soon as I saw this, Craig showed me this uh, several several, actually a couple of years ago when they were first starting on the thing, and uh, I said, well, this is great. This would be a great piece to have for robotics, because as you know, in a robot, you got lots of things happening <laughs> at the same time. You got sensors that are you're receiving, you're trying to coordinate rotor, motors, so you got a lot of things happening at the same time. So the CCR is beautiful for this kind of application. Marvelous. Uh, the services architecture, the so-called DSS, I don't know if you covered that in the, uh, in the, the we CCR. We have not yet. Well, that's the, com that's, that's the companion to the CCR. That is a services-oriented architecture that makes it very easy to write applications that are not only distributed by highly modular and, and compositional. So that means you can build up uh, higher level functions out of very simple functions. It also is inherently distributed, which means that you can put the you can put the the service or the code where you need where next to where you want to do the processing where you have the processing horsepower okay. so these pieces mean that we have a really rich foundation in terms of what's in here so it's not like oh let's wrap some cute little object oriented api into this mm -hmm. this is a uh, obviously based on what you know about the CCR, a very powerful piece of technology that sits at the core of our architecture that makes it possible to drive robots of all sorts of kinds. Now this, but if I can just, uh, this also of course implies that we're talking about a managed core. Because yes, you can't do this CCR is, without This is all based on managed. Yes. Well, uh, let, let me qualify that a little sure. bit. For the, the, the essential programming model is a, a you know, is, is uh, uh, directed for writing in managed code. However, services can be written in such a way that you can keep create proxies for, for code that may be written in C++. So for example, let's say you were going to create a vision library. For a vision library, the performance of the library may very, be very critical to you, and you might want to write that in C++. However, you can easily write a proxy wrapper that turns that into a service and makes that accessible 
through the managed code layer that we have. So it is, it's not, it, it is possible that you can combine this where you might have code that's not written in managed mm -hmm. code that you might be integrating into this. Yeah. Now, having said that also, that means that what we have will work not only with C Sharp, it will work with VB.net, it will work with Microsoft's Iron Python and any of the other uh, products in the in the um, in the suite, the Visual Studio suite. Excellent. And in fact, what we'll hopefully show you a demonstration of a little bit later on mm -hmm. is showing that you can even use JScript as a programming language to program robots with what we have. You mean JScript running in a browser? JScript running in a browser, talking to the robot, not only allowing you to wow. investigate the state of the motors, the state of the sensors, but also being able to actually drive the robot so you can write code uh, and we're going to show you some very exciting things here I think that show you what you can do even with JScript. So, um, so the runtime I mentioned is just the first part. The second part is a set of tools and we're going to be showing you that today as well. Okay. The tool set that we have include a, uh, a very high performance simulation tool which has very high quality uh, graphics rendering and we've paired that with the Agea physics engine. So that means you not only get high quality graphics, but you have real world physics. Agea is one of the leaders in uh, software physics. They also have a great hardware product for physics acceleration. So nice. you can put this and you can get I can't remember how many teraflops of, of performance you can get out of this, but this is essentially a physics coprocessor that you can plug into your PC. Wow. You don't need this to get the physics. This is just if you want even faster performance that you could get on your PC. Excellent. Cool. So the third part of what you're going to see in this toolkit is a, is, is a number of tutorials and sample code, and ultimately what you're going to find is... Um, on the window behind me. Okay. okay. The other thing that you're going to find in this is um, a set of uh, uh, tutorials. There are over 15 tutorials that come out of this. Some of them are in VB. There's mm -hmm. one in JScript. There's several in C Sharp. They start from the very basics about how to create a service or how do you access a service from these different programming languages. Uh, there's um, and and following on beyond this first technical preview. We're also looking to evaluate what Microsoft research libraries like in the area of vision, navigation, sound localization that we may be able to pull in to help people get started with doing some basic hard things that, that you have to do with a robot. As you can imagine, robots take a little more horsepower than your average PC. They have to know where they are, hopefully know where they are, <laughs> be able to navigate through a space where your PC just sits on your desktop. Certainly. So there are some more advanced technologies that, that can be used. Now, the important thing, though, to remember about this is the tools and the libraries that I mentioned are not exclusive. It's really an a la carte type uh, activity. You don't have to use the Microsoft tool set. We, will, we are actively working with third parties who will also offer their own tools, their own software libraries on top of this platform. So this is kind of the same model that Microsoft has adopted as in the past in terms of providing, like with Windows. Windows being a software platform that third parties can bring their hardware to, bring their software to, and then other people in the community consume it. Fantastic. So the last thing that I'll mention is in addition to our launch of our first technical preview, and it is just a technical preview right now, not the final release, is that we will be launching a website where there will be a news groups, there will be additional information that we'll put out on a regular basis, uh, we'll be blogging on there, so it will be a very active thing where we're hoping to communicate with the community and get their feedback about how we can, what they like about it, what kind of improvements they would like, and so, you know, allow us to communicate with, with the larger community that's out there that's consuming this. Fantastic. Now, um since the CCR is now part of the Robotics SDK, if I want to just utilize that component of the uh, SDK in an application running on a PC, can I do that? You absolutely can. Fantastic. So it, it's, it's still exposed. So <laughs> that's the interesting thing, um, is that while this is all about robotics, mm -hmm. there are components, as you already know from, from your information uh, on the CCR, you know that the CCR has wider spread applications and can be valuable beyond just the use of robotics. And certainly, while this is all encased within a robotics SDK, you can certainly write applications that have nothing to do with robots and just leverage what's there in the architecture. Fantastic. 
Well, let's go around and meet some of these Absolutely. people. Absolutely. Huh? Let's walk around here. Let's see. George, where are you? I'm hiding. You're hiding. <laughs> This is uh -oh. this is George, who I think you guys met yeah, before in George. the CCR uh, yeah. presentation. So How you, you doing? doing? Good. Good. I, I consider him my naturally caffeinated uh, development lead and architect. George, as you know, is very passionate about what he's doing, so it's great to have him working on this project and applying the CCR technology. <laughs> now he, he says on. that. We never hear that. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Fantastic. All right, so um, I think Andy gave you an introduction. We should um, go around and uh, introduce the team. Mm -hmm. we're, uh, we're actually very close. I mean, we're only now like three or four days away from our first public release. Okay, Excellent. So everybody's been working a lot. Maybe we'll let them go home today. <laughs> <laughs> but cool. uh, yeah, let's see some robots. Yeah, mainly you just writing code over here, huh? No robots. CCR well, I, uh, we got one. We got a little arm. One yeah. of our interns got going right now, and uh, cool. we have various things. Sure. Come and go. Cool. But uh, we actually do need a lot more hardware. I mean, the, the coolest hardware. <laughs> some we're working with also industrial uh, partners that are very serious into you know industrial robotics, the big arms that you know make your car and all that. Mm -hmm. And they're actually you know here today doing some cool stuff. Yeah, so we have KUKA, who is one of the largest industrial automation manufacturers of, ro of robotic arms. Mm -hmm. That's actually here. They're very excited about the technology we have, and they're they're here to learn more about it and to, to work out a demo that they will show at, at our announcement next week. So it's like big articulated robots and stuff. It's hard nice. to get one here, and if we do, we probably kill someone. <laughs> but, so now we're staying with a little cool. toy one. All right. Well, let's so uh, let's introduce yourself. Introduce Hi, Joseph and I am an architect program manager on Tandy's team, robotics team. Excellent. Yeah. Hi there. My name is Henrik. Henrik Nelson. I've uh, been doing web stuff for many years, and this is one of the parts hey, that we will be driving cool. this out. Very. Uh, this is very exciting. This is finally we getting there. We can put things out. And we can get uh, people's reaction to it. Very exciting. Excellent. Which is the power, as you mentioned earlier, of a technical preview. Yeah, yes. and, and Henrik is one of our experts here. On you know, he he was also working with George on the CCR and the DSS. So. But he didn't show up to that interview. He did. No, uh, they did it George. without me. Yeah, <laughs> tricked me. You were on the uh, invite, though. Huh. He'd be happy to tell you more about the services architecture that's in there, the D DSS that we have in there. So Absolutely. Cool. And we can, we can distribute it across multiple robots. Yes, it all is so. He's our portable uh, web guy. Yes. So. Fantastic. Yes. Hi, I'm Pavel and uh, I'm a developer on the team working mostly on the UI stuff and uh, the end gadgets. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I can show you probably what uh, we're doing here. So one of the things uh, that uh, we want to do is uh, to provide some simple UI to control the robot. And uh, through our um, runtime what we can do is we can start a node that's going to uh, host our UI. Um, all we have to do is launch it. And then we have it integrated with uh, live.com gadgets Wow! to have some simple ways of controlling the robot. So that uh, the robot that we have over here is I'm going to try to move it around and get uh, information from it. So the way I do it is uh, I have a URL for the robot. I'm going to connect to it. And this is the gadget for connecting to the robot. It has sent information to a different gadget for controlling the robot. And uh, for, through this gadget, I can now move the robot. So, for example, I can move it left, right, forward and back, however I want. And unplug it from the power so that it can run the batteries. So check this out. This means that any you can go up to a kiosk and without anything else, hook up to a robot and start rolling it around. Wow. That's all you need cool. Is That's very cool. All you need is a web browser that can run script. Yes. Yes. Nice. Straight up HTML J script. Very cool. Fancy. And what you see here, actually, if you look at Pavel's look at the laser stuff. Yeah. Is yeah, we'll it. And George walks. This is the laser you see my data. Feet? These are the feet that you see. And there are two representations. This is a top uh, the top view, kind uh -huh. of looking uh, from the roof. And this is a forward projection, cylindrical projection, as uh, even a, like a 3D game. Mm. And you can see his feet moving. Yeah. The other thing we can do with, for example, <laughs> yeah, this UI is just click on the picture uh -huh. and have the robot run there. Yeah, look at it move. 
Oh, okay. He's trying to break away. <laughs> I'll take it back, whatever I did to you yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we not only can control the robot, we can get information back from it. So oh, let me kick the bumper. Yes, we have a list of bumpers here, and as you see, when he hits the bumpers, mm -hmm. uh, we get some notifications from the robot. And this is not actually through polling, we're getting the data pushed back from the robot, so we don't have to actively poll ah. to find out if it's pressed or not. So how are you communicating with this robot? Through web services, right? Oh, well, similar. Or something similar. We're using uh, a very simple application model that we've been working on, which is part of the DSS model that we're bringing out. And the concept there really is that we have very simple interaction mechanisms for doing subscriptions and for doing request response. It's very simple, not a lot of big specs and things that interact with each other. Mm -hmm. Very simple. And so what you see here is really you can you can talk to any of the robots if you can write a little bit of script, if you can write a little bit of basically Python or BB, mm -hmm. you can work with what we have. So you should actually see how you can now not just control the robot. And so but you can is, actually code against it. Really so, but wait, there's more. <laughs> Excellent. So one of the other things is all of the demonstration that uh, I've shown right now, mm -hmm. it has been scripted. So I can replay it's most of it. Yeah. Yes. And um, for example, if I move the robot over here, as you can see, it says rotate robot, move robot, and the robot moves. And if I hit, for example, um, let's take this out. run, the robot will repeat the exact same steps that we provided to it. Mm -hmm. So now you can observe the robot, you can push it around, and then you get a little list of the things that you did. And you now you can say, well, run oh, this, it and it will repeat the thing. And you can muck around with it. You can change the order a little bit. So you can say, now I have exactly what my robot needs to do. And then you have that without writing anything other than a few commands. That's really, really cool. So the other thing we can do is we can make the robot talk using the speech. Nice. Uh, SDK. So we can have it say, hello, everyone. And again, this hello, is all everyone. <laughs> so, say it again. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so, so, here's the last HTTP. so the last thing you want to show is something that, that seems trivial, but now try and say, we want to, in fact, not just have it say something. We want to say something when something happens to the robot. Okay. That means say we want to kick the bumper, and we want it to say, ouch. Mm -hmm. So why don't you go ahead and do that? Wow. This is just a simple orchestration. Cool. I mean, through code, we can do a lot ouch. more complicated stuff, and we'll show you that. Mm -hmm. But ouch. we want people just to, here, here, I can just say, ouch. Ouch. As we've recorded, uh, for example, it also records what we say. So the other thing I can do is I can program right here through JScript what it's going to say. So we can change, for example, this text to say ouch again. And uh, if you hit the front bumper now. Watch this. Ouch again. Ouch again. Ouch. Ouch again. Ouch. Ouch again. Ouch. Very nice. So I uh, made a few changes to so it's a very kind of simple uh, yeah. way to start and uh, interact with the robot and uh, what I do just through JScript and uh, kind of very straightforward behavior programming. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's a nice uh, way for people who are not kind of too in-depth to kind of get going or present a very nice web-oriented uh, uh, UI model. Certainly. So, I mean, what are some real-world examples of using this? Like maybe you could have uh, your robot cleaning your pool or something you can communicate to. to that would be nice. Go back to the deep end again. Yes, you can. Now, some of the things that this actually demonstrates uh -huh. is that robots come and UI come from many different places. Mm -hmm. And you want to have a UI that is what we call compositional. You just want to say, you can think of this as a dashboard. You want to control things. And obviously that applies to much more than just robots. Mm -hmm. But you want to say, I want to throw in a gadget that shows the temperature, the pressure of the, of the tires, or whatnot. And mm -hmm. none of those knew about each other up front. What happens is that you throw them together on the page and they can start communicating with each other and you can start orchestrating them so you can say not just when the bumper is hit say ouch but if the temperature goes beyond something that is too hot do something else and you can have very or rich orchestration simply through the through the UI here and obviously this applies to lots of things you can do certainly now is there a concurrency story for the scripted model oh you bet this Ooh. because everything that happens here is concurrent Beautiful, right? The, the CCR is actually running underneath, underneath. NIE. Yeah. In, NIE. Yeah. This this inside, 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 inside uh -oh. in here. We actually, what happened when we started out mm -hmm. was that you, we said you can go up to an arbitrary browser, download a little bit, and get running. What we have here is actually, you're actually running one of our nodes. 
a DSS node that we call it that has CCR in it and has a set of services for finding each other. So all these in this single web page, you actually see four gadgets that are hooked together as if they are talking to each other like small services. Now, they could be on the same page, they could be across the network, they don't care, we don't care, they just find each other and they chat. Excellent. Excellent. Your initial question of how can this be used? The UI can be customized for a particular use. If you have like a factory, you want a person to have a particular view of the robot, another person to have a different view of the robot, that could be very easily customized. So the UI is presented as appropriate for that particular job function. So hmm. you can have a pool of little gadgets that you can integrate into the, uh, into the person who's looking it's at it. And it's all cool. accessible through a simple handheld device because you would just navigate through IE. Wow. So it changes how you think about a classic application because now it becomes UI becomes fluid, compositional, you just throw things in there, you have them communicate, it's all very dynamic, scriptable, and you just plug it together and play. Fantastic. Scriptable robots. And, it, and it's just this, I mean, this, this is all based on the model that's just HTTP and we separate state from behavior. And this is what Henrik and I have been working on is separate state, make it something that you can understand when it's being modified, mm -hmm. and then PCCR and to coordinate those course level handlers. And you can do with one line, say this is exclusive, this is concurrent. So people already have something very rich. You do a get on it, you get the state. This is how we debug, but we'll show you this a little bit later. Fantastic. And very a lot of cool. people from yes. low end, I mean, the toy robots you see here, to very high end, they just love the inspectability of the model. This mm -hmm. is how they won. I mean, we've talked to people that won the DARPA challenge, and they said this is exactly the architecture that they hand-built again and again and again. Excellent. And we do offer this. Our entire system is built this way also. So we, we have a very good feel for how sort of experience with it, how it works. Excellent. So let me show you some more stuff. Thank uh, you, Pavel. Thank you. Here's uh, David. Hi. How you David doing? Lee. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So uh, one of the things that I've been working on is having a data contract uh, that can be shared across to, uh, similar robotics equipment. So, uh, so what we have here is a, is a very small um, uh, Lego NXT, which uh, is due to come out in, ne in the next month or so. Okay. And, uh, and next to it is a Fisher Technique. Uh, which, uh, which is built, both of these are built um, as a two-wheel differential drive. And what I have is a uh, standard contract that defines what, what driving means. And, and then we've written um, some samples like this dashboard here, which uh, allows me to use a joystick and to drive a vehicle. And it doesn't need to know which vehicle it's connected to. I, I um, hook up a manifest and I and I configure it to say I'm I'm connecting to a Lego or I'm connecting to a Fisher Technique or I'm connecting to an Arcos Pioneer, one of the the larger machines that you saw over there. Mm -hmm. And with any of those, I can now use the joystick and drive it around. And so it's just one application which uh, can connect to all of these different services, uh, and and they look. Uh, similar. So it's basically when you say contracts, it's sort of like interface. Yes. In so yes. You're implementing the interface that it's going to understand, and so it doesn't That's really correct. matter about the implementation details. Yes. Cool. So let me just go ahead and and uh, connect this to the uh, the Lego, and what I'm going to do is is I set up the port uh, that it's running on, and I connect. And now when, oh, let me turn on my Lego. Mm -hmm. And establish my connection. Now let's give it a try. All right, let me set it down on the floor. Very I, cool. I can also switch to another to the other service, which is my joystick service. I've got two separate services. They're both talking to the contract um, independently. But if I um, earlier I was controlling with this dialog box right here and just clicking, and as I click on one of these uh, buttons, mm -hmm. the robot reacts. Now I have a separate service running, which has some UI on it, and this one is connected to my joystick right here. So as I turn the joystick, it um, it will move. Now when I hold down on the button, mm -hmm. I can control the, the robot. I almost uh, spilled, uh, spilled these 
a uh, little drink on his lap because we had this thing on the on the big board table when we were doing the demo. <laughs> so it would have been a quick end to the project. But <laughs> we stopped right before. Excellent. Cool. Really cool. Thanks. Thank you. All right. We have other little wheel robots, but you get you get the idea. Yes. One, one thing I would. It's a great idea. One of the things we I, maybe David already mentioned this is these services that he's he's created here mm -hmm. are actually reusable so you can attach them to any of the robots that you see here so yep. uh, that's you know that's a great part of what we're doing here is the reusability of, of the code mm -hmm. this is this is something that most people in the robotics community don't have right now they let alone have solutions being able to apply re reapply the same <laughs> bits of code over and over again to a variety of different platforms is something that most of them have already told us that we've disclosed this to that it's very exciting for them to be able to have that. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let me show very you some, cool. uh, some different types of robots too. And again, we're a little bit hardware constrained, but we're doing our best. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, here's some more people in the team. Okay. Hey, I'm Andres. I'm Dev. Dev, right on. Hi, I'm Paul. I'm a developer. Nice to meet you. So what are we looking at here? So here we have a Condo KHR1 humanoid robot. Uh, of course. There are, this is one of three or four available on the market, made typically by servo manufacturers. Um, and he's a set, essentially a set of 17 servos and two servo control boards. And we can set the position of each of the servos and make him do some cool stuff. Excellent. So on screen you can see I have a service that has an entry for each servo. Okay. And I can tweak these individually. I'll give you an example. These aren't labeled, but I happen to know that servo number six on board zero is, the, is his head. So if you watch his head, uh, you can <laughs> and you can see we're just using IE. You just bring up heat. I mean, Paul came up with all these beautiful XLTs you're seeing. It just transforms the state. All we're doing is we're doing a, a get on the state of this robot service. Mm -hmm. It transforms it, gives a little way to both read and write data. And then mm -hmm. the web browser is your tool. This is what you use to interact. And then, of course, you also have code that can asynchronously interact with each other, use the CCR, use no, DSS, and do high level of orchestrations. And we can show you that a little bit later. That's so it can walk, turn its head, move its arms. Exactly. You know, yes. so another service, yell out. Another service could tell it to assume a certain position or to perform a sequence of actions or program a sequence of actions into it. So we don't have those services yet, but it's very Now you cool. can start building abstractions. And, and the important thing about our model is we, we don't necessarily do inheritance. We don't have these complicated models that are the traditional object models that this derives from this, and if you're a sensor, then you can be like, uh, you know, a laser rangefinder and all that. It's more like a composition. Sometimes you'll be used as a sensor, sometimes you'll be a more higher level thing, and uh, it's more of this mashup, as actually people are saying, of things that you stitch together and you're creating applications. Okay. And, and you're just seeing that it's really based on state. It, any behavior that we have is triggered by state changes. We don't have arbitrary events saying light is on or are moved. Literally. So let's talk about that though for a second. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's important. What you're saying is this is not an event-driven model. It actually you saying, is that what you it, it is an event-driven model, but it's not um, unbound or or generic event-driven model. It's really just tied to state. Just okay. think of having, and state can be anything. I mean, uh, earlier we showed you the laser rangefinder had a JPEG, okay. and this is the REST model. I mean, you just basically say you can represent yourself whichever way you want, but we do structured stuff. So you can say, I have a portion of my state that changed. Mm -hmm. The event can only be that this portion of the state changed. Mm -hmm. Not just some name that you throw up. You see yeah, what I'm saying? You this way, the so object. It's, it's, yeah. It's a very, okay. so it's a, you can think of it as, if you know RSS for doing websites when they update, this is a fine-grained version of that, where okay. you don't have to poll for the document. When it changes, it will actually send you a little notification that now I have changed. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what you see here on the, on the screen is a very good representation of state. You see a set of properties. Mm -hmm. now, and, and, that's you, and that's what you can think of when you see when you see this guy, there's he really one. has a set of properties. Is he has his legs, his 
hands and his uh, head. And you can say the properties are really what position are they in, are they moving, are they doing anything. And if they're not doing anything, they're just there, they don't change. But if they move, they start changing values. And now other services can observe those values, in fact get notified, so they can start comp composed with each other. That's a very simple model based on this state paradigm that we keep bringing up all the time. And it turns out to be, it fits robotics very nicely, simply because lots of the things we want to describe have these properties. Is the motor on? Is the arm waving? Whatever is happening? And all that we can do very nicely through this model. And of course it matches in very, it's, it is, as, as George also has been saying, very close to the web model. So we can use existing web infrastructure, even RSS and whatnot and XML and XSLT, all of it just works with what we do because we're just accessible through HTTP. Excellent. So here's what was behind cool. it to really get an idea of what we mean by state. Okay. These are the servo positions right now that you're seeing. And what well, Paul was doing, he was just transforming them within IE to give you a little bit friendlier UI. Okay. But underneath, if I want to debug something quickly, people bring up their service. It's up and running. It's like 10 lines of code to bring this up. It's already bound to HTTP. You don't have to worry about all that. And then you can debug it. You do a get on IE. Mm, I see what it's doing. Excellent. No, and you know, the consequence some... of this is also that you can put the computation where you want because on this guy, obviously, you don't have a lot of stuff running on it, so you have to run a lot of it on your PC. Mm -hmm. But on the Pioneer that you saw, the very first, the big ones with wheel on it, yes. it actually runs a PC. It is a PC on wheels. Uh -huh. So it runs complete all our stuff as, as is. Mm -hmm. So we can kind of put things where it makes sense. Okay. You can even have multiple robots talking to each other and create swarms. And it all just hooks up naturally over the network. Excellent. So, Very cool. So another thing. Well, thank uh, you. Thank you. And we'll probably keep talking to you, but <laughs> we're moving down this way now. So Andreas can describe, uh, he did a higher order functionality, which is common in robotics where you orchestrate and you have some more complicated state machines. And again, you use the CCR to manage the state transitions. Okay. And you can talk a little bit about the logic that you put in. So what we have here is uh, one of those off-the-shelf robots, which runs a set of our services. Uh, uh -huh. We have base level services that do like the, bas the basic stuff that you need it talks to the uh, controller board that sits on the robot, which is the motor on and off, and reports the state of the controller back. So how fast my wheels are turning, what does the laser see? Mm -hmm. So we have uh, for the robot a couple of services sitting on there. So there's a service for the drive system that moves it forwards and backwards. Mm -hmm. And that service actually speaks the same contract that the little Lego thing uh, mm -hmm. has. So we can, we can use the same orchestration to drive the little Lego thing to the big thing. And then we'll nice. show you in simulation, uh -huh. in a very realistic physics simulation, using the same services that David showed you. Mm -hmm. We can apply them and drive this stuff, we can apply them and interact with the Lego stuff and also with the simulation stuff. So there's a, there's a lot of reuse going on, mostly because the structure of you know, the document or the, or the robot is very similar. Cool. Now, when you, you first learned about and started working with the CCR in this project, right? So, yes. So how, how, how was your, what was your impression when you first encountered it? So programmatically. Programmatically. So what did you it, think of it? it? It was a very great offering. I loved it the first instance I saw it. Uh, mm -hmm. It is, when you're involved with writing distributed systems and, and systems that are inherently par parallel, like robots are, uh -huh. the CCR is really the only pattern that, that matches that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, it's just a great experience of, of uh, writing applications uh, for this. Nice, cool. nice example is this. Uh, this oh, is loose now. Yeah, so we, oh, we what's are. going on here? She's so spinning this wheel. So, huh? so we have the basic services that I just described, but we also have a service that subscribes to all the basic services. Mm -hmm. Now it takes the state of those basic services, measures them up, measures them up, makes a decision about what it sees. So we have the laser range finder here, which, which gets me a sta scan of my environment. Okay. Now you're standing in front of it. Okay. Which so is it knows that. Yeah, which is why it's turning it's slowly. Down, yeah. ah. when, you, when you go back, it would, would move. So we're going to let it loose now, and you'll Parts see how it. it'll avoid you and all that. And, um, okay, bye-bye. So now, step in front of me. Go ahead. So now it tries, to find, right. it tries to find a new way based on what it sees. Very cool. And now it's found it, and we can actually let it out. <laughs> it won't. It's afraid of me. It's afraid. It's afraid. No, it's let shy. It let it out. <laughs> we should bring a simple da David, can you connect to this system with a simple dashboard? Let me talk to you. We have a problem oh, here. Yes, okay. When we do let it out, it has a tendency just to 
go and wander <laughs> off, and yeah. people yeah. in the building want to know who it is. And, yeah, and it's trying to find it. Trap itself. it. Um, it, gets, it. It gets boxed in and shut in people's offices. This is what researchers do, for, apparently. Well, that's fine. So do you think there's any implications for the use of this platform for developing sort of intelligence in a robot? Like, could you utilize, because thinking requires several parallel processes, obviously. Well, what we try to do here is to put the basics in place so that you don't have to start doing the basics of sending messages and building applications and all that kind of stuff for you. Mm -hmm. We would love, and we, we actually work with researchers to try and come up with very high level abstractions for doing AI and whatnot. That's always difficult, yeah. and we're not trying to say we solve that. <laughs> of course. But what we do is provide an infrastructure that enables people to play with this in a serious way so that they can build these high level functions on that. And you're mm -hmm. about to be, well, he's wandering off. Yeah, he touched my foot and then moved back. It's an enabling factor in that regard. Sure. And what we would like to do is to collaborate with as many researchers as we can to build a community and to build reuse and to enable this through our platform here so that we can get um, community going, we can get benefits of people starting playing with it and build bigger and more, more apps. We're just in the beginning here. This is obviously just the very early on and we would like to see very complicated robots um, and I'm sure they will evolve. Absolutely. Our model also maps fairly closely to models that people are using in learning network systems. Mm. So there is a natural progression, I think, as people get used to this, where we, sure. we may start to see those kinds of systems using this. And it's a natural, it's a natural mix because the robot work exists in an unpredictable environment. So learning systems fit that pretty yeah. well. Fantastic. But wait, there's more. There's more. Of course, there is. So do you want to, we can show you the live view of the laser. I don't know how we're doing our time. We have about 23 minutes left of film. Okay. So um, so this guy is in autonomous mapping now. He's using the, the laser data and the bumping data and all that to make it, so it stop. Yeah. Trying to find another way around. Calculating. How can I get away from that guy? How can I get yeah. away from George? <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, George it's very boy. common. Nice this, job, we're, we're, we're showing this application because we want to show people that more interesting orchestration with a lot of state transitions. If you try to do it with threads and yeah. locking and all that, it really gets very yeah. messy soon. Well, could you imagine if the threads start locking and or, well, you know, you have I mean, it's, it's the threads, and the other thing is <laughs> failure, right? I mean, it's, it's things now it's combinatorial explosion of the failure cases. Mm -hmm. So you really want to have a couple of lines saying, do this, do this, do this. And if they all succeed, do this, or if anything fails, do that. Try doing that with a synchronous programming pattern or doing it with events. You're going to write a lot of code again and again, and you're going to get it wrong. Totally. Um, so that's the stuff that we're trying to do, and it's just a, a perfect fit for this. It's fantastic. I mean, what you're doing basically is eliminating the, not eliminating, but really reducing potential for writing bugs into your robots. <coughs> yes, absolutely. We're writing so. new bugs into our robots. But yeah, but they're <laughs> <laughs> But they work well asynchronously. Great. The point, the point that you always have to, to understand, I think software is the same thing. It's really that we're not running out of CPU power. We don't need concurrency so much for that. We need it for responsiveness. Sure. People are writing applications that are not responsive because they're afraid to touch the file and also read something from the server because then the failure cases explode. Sure. And, and our model kind of helps you with that, both the DSS model and the CCR model. Absolutely. And it just goes from there. And robots, I think, it's just are going to make it clear that things are loosely coupled Excellent. and things go wrong. So we do actually a lot more advanced stuff when it comes to failure handling. We have this, this concept of causality, so you have this logical flow. It's mm -hmm. kind of similar to transactions, it's just it's not very heavy weight because it doesn't give you the same guarantees. Okay. But you can do things like, if I send a request to this robot, but this robot, mm -hmm. without me knowing, sends 10 other requests mm -hmm. that now, in a tree-like fashion, propagate through its system. Mm -hmm. And anything goes wrong, we can have a single handler that basically takes care of that. Think of it as a generalized, a generalization over the tri cats but over many machines and many processors. Nice. Which is a really sweet way to debug. Absolutely. It's like a, it's, it poisons the system with this flow essentially and then anything goes wrong, you can go back to one place and start handling it. Outstanding. So, so that really helps. But wait, there's more. Well, but of course. So now what do we have? So, an, another thing that we believed uh, very strongly about and because we're Microsoft, we, turn, we want to turn a hardware problem into a software problem. <laughs> 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 I 
not that software is easy or anything. Mm -hmm. But the thing we've been working on is we, we partner with a GIA that does a, a really high end, a very nice uh, physics engine. Okay. And this physics engine has been used in games, of course. But we recognized early on that, that uh, games share a lot of things with robotics. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they do is they have, essentially they model things in the game environment as actors or as bots or as robots. They have sensory interfaces. They, have, they use physics to give you this realism and constrain things just like they would in the real world. And of course they have really nice rendering. All that to, to immerse you. Now it turns out that robotics needs a lot of that if you want a prototype. A lot of this hardware is actually expensive. It's actually rare. Okay. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping this, this changes. But right now, you, you're probably going to have a laptop or you're just going to have your PC. But you want to do robotics, right? Mm -hmm. So having a really good simulator, something that allows you very easily to go in and with a couple of lines of code have entities. And we have tutorials, by the way, on our website that will show this. That you can add things to the world. But it's not a toy. It doesn't stop there. Mm -hmm. You can do extremely advanced stuff. You can have thousands of objects, you can have very complicated friction models, you can have very complicated joint models, you can have all that stuff. And we actually have this running and it's, it's available. Fantastic. Not only we have it running, but we're actually using the same services to create our robots and interact with them without rewriting those services. It's basically a, an enormous amount of reuse and it's already distributed. I'm running my simulation, you can participate. You can come and join in Absolutely. and drop entities. So you can imagine community building where, where some people focus on the 3D models. Mm -hmm. Let me show you something. Uh, we had an intern, Diego, that, that did a really good job creating models in Maya or your favorite CAD program. So you've seen the pioneers, right? I mean, look at this one in our simulated environment. It's a pretty nice model of the, of the robot. Absolutely. And you do this in Maya or whatever. And we also did a model it has like 170,000 polygons, a little bit overkill, but, you know, the Lego mm -hmm. that you saw. So this is a visualization of our simulator. We don't have, we just have a few objects just to test. This is basically a test. Mm -hmm. um, this is another thing that sits with the DirectX SDK, and it's just a mess. But we show you in the physics world mm. how everything is modeled. So basically, in physics, you have some very simple, oh, our buddy here is... is trying to figure out what to do. He wants to learn about the physics he, stuff. He actually always come by. If you notice, there's these papers right under oh, the danger of robotics. Whoa. Is, so the laser didn't pick up the, uh, ooh, a little bit. Sorry about shaking out there, everybody. Oh, it's all right. Oh, look, the arm died. <laughs> this is way too skinny for, for the laser to see. <laughs> This really is a danger around So what is it, just a scanning laser that's just scanning around? or? So what this laser is, it's basically a plane, and you're, you're emitting, it has a, a rotating mirror, uh -huh. and it has an infrared, it's an infrared laser, and um, it gives you distance measurements. And okay. that's what you show the cylindrical projections with distance measurements. Uh -huh. But because it's a plane, anything under it and above it, it won't see. Now in the DARPA challenges, what people did is they took multiple of these and oriented them vertically or horizontally uh -huh. so they can create a more complete view of their environment. Sure. Here we just have one and it actually is very expensive. So one mm -hmm. of the things we're going to be working on is vision um, slam, which is simultaneous localization and mapping. So just using a webcam, okay. you can now start replacing lasers and starting to doing this type of detection. So we're going to be coupling together, and we're working with research and, and, and other people outside that sure. are going to be using vision to make robotics affordable. Outstanding, because if you use sonar, you're saying it wouldn't be. So sonar has issues. Laser, a lot of people use laser because it's just a much more accurate thing and you get better precision. Okay. Uh, sonar is just very noisy and it's, it's, not, it's not very well understood yet how you can do this mapping using just sonar. Okay. So using vision or using laser, we think we have we can have a pretty good way of getting stuff being autonomous. Outstanding. Now, in the simulation what you're seeing, because we want people to debug and get things running, you can mm -hmm. trivially create an approximation of your robot. And what we've done is we have some wheels and we have this box being, you know, the main motor base and some bumpers and then the laser on top. Now, these are actual models that interact with other things and mm -hmm. I can drive them the same exact way you saw when we drove the other stuff. So, again, I have to punch in where this is running. Here's the services that are running on this node. And I can connect to the laser, and this is a simulated laser seeing mm. things in the, in the virtual world. What is it seeing? The table. Excellent. So you're getting the same view that we showed you earlier, but this is actually the simulated world, and we're doing ray casting to simulate a laser. Okay. And 
Of course, we can drive it. So let's try this little guy around. Uh, okay, there he goes. And the wheels are rotating. Actually, the physics engine is really good. He's a little bit jumpy because we're applying torque and it's not calibrated. But, you know, the wheels are spinning. Let's go back. The table is kind of heavy for it. There we go. The center of mass is not over the wheel, so it's doing what you would expect. Mm -hmm. um, the model actually, you know, can uh, model the suspensions, it can model the tires with longitudinal and lateral friction and all that stuff. And of course you can visualize it. Now, the dots that you're seeing is actually a visualization through a little pixel shader of uh, the laser. Okay. Because I have two of them. So this guy is actually now scanning this guy. So you hmm. can see the impact points of the laser, and because we're in simulation, we can actually visualize them and tell you what the laser is seeing. Okay. Now, in terms of scaling, what I want to show you is, uh, and by the way, we can hit this node right here, just like anything else. You can debug your simulation again using IE. So what is running? Here's a little directory that shows the services are running. You can go to any one of our nodes and do that. Okay. And we have abstracted our console output. Here's a little XSLT that basically changes. <laughs> nice. Sorry about that. That's that's all right. <laughs> Here's the debug output. So when we, we when we do stuff mm -hmm. because the robots are autonomous, we want to connect and see what's happening on the robot. And this is some spew that happened. And again, you can get this in a directory. The other thing you can see is the simulation engine. And what we're doing now, we serialized every single thing that it happens in the simulation. So you can see position, a quaternion that shows the orientation, the current yes. velocity, the mass and the density, the height field which gives you properties about the ground, restitution, dynamic friction, and all that. This is Excellent. what's running in the simulation. Okay. Now let's add some objects in the simulation as it's running. So look over here. I just dropped the ball. <laughs> And I'm going to drop, drop some more. Drop the globe on it. Yeah, drop the yeah. globe on it. And you can see the laser is scanning it. I just want to showcase texture objects. That's just a test. Okay. But now I'm going to start adding a lot of objects. So it's going to be a mess. Check this out. Whoa. And the collisions are happening just like you would expect. Contact points are being generated. Um, and I'm just adding objects now. So we have like 200 or 300 objects right now wow. in the okay. simulation. And you can see the ball is rotating around, mm -hmm. and the laser is scanning, and all that. So the perspective now, you see this, the robot? Yeah. It's seeing some solid objects in front of it. Mm -hmm. So let's move it. Oh, it's actually under here. Look how it's moving the objects. Let me show you. I see They're it. pretty lightweight. Sure. <laughs> It's trying to move them away. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see how it's seeing through them and all that. That is really cool. So that down there represents its vision of... This is the trying. laser representation. Got and it. this is the same laser service. It's just a simulated version of the laser service that you were seeing so before. So you saw over there and you put right. your foot in front of it. Right, exactly. exactly. We're just consuming it the same way. So the simulated from the real one, it's a little bit hard to distinguish. Now, when we do ray casting, the physics is, is so good that we can get the material properties of what you're hitting. Mm -hmm. So you can actually model glass. You can model things that have opacity, or you can model things that diffuse. Mm -hmm. You can introduce noise in the model. So you can do really nice physics. Excellent. And again, we're giving this to people to really bootstrap them. A lot of people would have been able to do, I think, Physics doesn't replace everything, but mm -hmm. it gives you a very neat way when you don't have hardware to prototype and try new ideas. Absolutely. But you really get very far in robotics because you can compose things that is just impossible to do in real time, mm -hmm. in, in real life. I mean, Stanley, for example, the robot, there was only one. It was really expensive. A lot of people wanted to work around and drive it around, mm -hmm. but you can't afford to do that. You either kill someone or destroy the robot. Exactly. Now, here you won't get exactly there, but you can do concurrent development. Again, concurrency, but in a, in a weird sort of way. Now, and basically, you know... And this is all, by the way, running concurrently again. We're actually using the CCR. I mean, the, phys the geophysics engine does is multi-threaded, mm -hmm. but the way we're doing this is that we have, once per frame, we're, we're spawning little tasks to allow each entity to compute its state and its collisions um, independently. And again, we use the CCR in a simple spawn to do all that, and then an aggregation. We do a scatter and a gather. Very cool. So that's what we had to show about simulation. Yeah. Uh, but now you could create, you could take that code that you've just written and apply it to the real robot without making Abs Absolutely. I mean, this, this is I the mean, whole point. You're yes. an orchestrator, like the Explorer service. Sure. You want to do something that does autonomous mapping. You can get pretty close developing everything 
talking to the simulated services. Yes. You don't have to write the actual robot. And then you launch and you deploy on our robot. Okay. And you get pretty close. So that's what we're trying to enable. Very cool. So, yeah. Now, I don't know what we have next. I think we wanted to show the arm as well. Yes. But that's really a, a key property of our system, that you can swap things in and out. Either they are software enablers, you've just seen simulation services, or they are hardware services, mm -hmm. or they are living close to you, or they cross the network. We don't care, and we talk to them the same way, and it just works. Excellent. So and I'll show you, uh, um, Iris, another intern that we have. She uh, actually brought this up really quick. So it took her like a day to write uh, a service again. <laughs> yeah, it is, it's my full it's address. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a little bit... <laughs> so, so you, you want to hold it from the bottom? Because yeah, you're you right. It. Yeah. But this is a Link 6, Link 6 uh, arm. It's controlled through a little board that has some of the GANs already built for X, but walk and so on and so forth. But uh, you can individually control each of the servers. And that's what she's doing for an IE page again, similar model. You cool. punch in a value and it'll move. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah. So, yes, it scares me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not afraid to admit it. Yeah. So, so to, to the server, if you were to send a position thing, it will actually move rapidly. Mm -hmm. We can also stage it so that you can actually have a much more smoother transition across, and you can coordinate that across all of the six or seven sensors that you have, servers that you have. Very so we're cool. building this up. I mean, this is a very low level, and this is an idea of how the model evolves. Mm -hmm. You start with something that you can quickly debug and interact with. Sure. Then you start doing some higher level function. You abstract in the form of a service that to it the command is very simple. It's mm -hmm. moving a coordinate space. Here it's servo positions, too low level, right? Mm -hmm. So you write a different service that says an orchestration or just a high, higher level service that says move in this coordinate space. And that's how you build up. And the Explorer was another example when we had the wheeled robot, where it basically you send it commands that are very high level, mm -hmm. but again, in an asynchronous fashion, you're interacting, you're receiving messages, you're fusing. It's, it's, it's a perfect example of fusion from sensor and actuators and getting something done. This is how software actually works. This is not just robotics. Sure. So in terms Excellent. Of, so in terms of coordination, you actually see uh, an arm here. You also have a Linksys uh, hexapod that's being coordinated to walk, and all the GANs are being programmed and orchestrated through uh, our so services. Very and, cool. And, and it's not in the lab right now, but it's being worked on. So Iris, you, you're an intern, yes. and you approach this uh, API, you know, fresh. Yes. So it didn't take you very long to get up to speed on no, it, huh? this is uh, actually my third week here. Okay. And um, I've already wrote a service uh, monitoring ba battery powers, and this is, I just got the arm on Friday, and I've been able to build this up. Really cool, and you've done it in JScript, uh, pretty much? No, I, oh. it's in C-sharp, along with all the other services. Okay, very cool. Well, that's an important point. Yeah, so, so most you of say our code is actually in C-sharp, sure. and this is where you, you use the CCR to coordinate. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to write in JScript, we have little wrappers that you can basically interface with in a structured way with .NET. Sure. And we also have VB examples. But again, our, our model in C-SARP is, as I said, it's just some handlers and some high-level attributes describing the coordination, mm -hmm. and we take care of the rest. And most of the code we've written is C-SARP, but the stuff you see here is how naturally it interfaces with the web world. Yeah. That here you have just a little form, and we, but we gave you so much infrastructure to make this like two lines mm -hmm. to, to parse structured data and communicate with your browser. And we also have a high-speed transport if you want to do, you know, binary transfers and all that, or through HTTP, so. Very cool. Let me show you some more. I mean, it's just nice an endless. Nice job. <laughs> um, I didn't know that. Whoa. I didn't know I had a celebrity. I was uh, robot yeah. standoff? The, the yes. team is about to, 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 to crash. You guys have robot wars in here? And just for fun? Uh, no, it gets yeah, late at we, night? We, we keep that off tape. Like, <laughs> 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 oh, really? A little robot. This is about as small as it gets in terms of tethered robots. And, um, but this is, uh, so I'm uh, just starting the uh, Bluetooth. I have Fisher Technique, robots, mm -hmm. other different prototype machines. Mm -hmm. uh, So this is controlling a basic uh, stamp. It, it, it's running a basic stamp too. And what we have done is we've written services 
that could communicate with the robot. I'm just complying the project and just running it right now. He's about to leave for uh, our announcement actually. We're going to announce a robot business so we're going to ship all these robots out and have a lot of partners. We had an enormous support from a lot of robotics people that are endorsing us and using our stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's been, it's been really cool because we, I mean, here we are, like no names in robotics and all these people have been doing it for a long time. And they're endorsing us and they're using this stuff right away. Very so, cool. So here we have a uh, little robot completely under control here. Now, if you notice that no, no. <laughs> that uh, it's slightly jerky, so one of the reasons is because it, this is running a single thread on the bot. On the bot, oh. and we are taking a two times delay on the uh, Bluetooth communication on that. And we can actually we are writing some software that will be put on over here mm -hmm. that will. Uh, simplify the uh, or smoothen the transitions further. One day we'll have little mini CCR running on very lightweight stuff. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, and and also really check this thing out. We'll have it running in Windows. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So now he's been put to a little bit of an autonomous control. And if you were to... <laughs> All right. All right. Very cool. So... Very nice. Yeah, that's it. We're so, you know, we have a little bit more time left. So, I mean, this, you know, what, what do you want to say to the people out there who are going to start using the SDK? Did you talk about how long we've been doing this or how short we've been doing this? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a very exciting opportunity because this, uh, this is a very small team working on a very exciting, innovative new project. So what you see is a lot of production from a, a small number of people who are really passionate about what they're doing. So it's, it's pretty exciting. We're really looking forward to, you know, the announcement and making the technical preview available to people mm -hmm. so that the idea is to get their feedback because this is just this is just our technical preview. This is just to give people an opportunity to try it out, see what they like, and to give us feedback back so that we can incorporate that and improve what we're trying to do here. Sure. So um, so we're really excited, you know. It, um, this is the result of talking to a lot of people in the community. Uh, before this project got started, um, Bill Gates asked me to go out and, and spend time with members of the different community uh, in the academic space, in the educational space, in the research space, the hobbyist space, and even in the commercial uh, space, and talk to the various segments of the community and find out whether they were interested in Microsoft doing something in this space and what they would like Microsoft to do. And the feedback has been, the input was very positive. Uh, almost, Everyone said that it would be incredible for Microsoft to do something like this in this space. And so that review went to, to Bill. That information went back to Bill as, as feedback. Uh, it was further reviewed by Craig Mundy and Rick Rashid. And through they, they all unanimously felt like it was, it was a good thing for Microsoft to get started in this space. And so that's how we got started. And they mm -hmm. still feel this way, which is really cool. Excellent. <laughs> we we, and a really small team pulled this off. That's yeah. pretty yeah, incredible. That's incredible. And it'll scale to millions of And we're just starting. We're just good. getting started. We're going to get feedback, and we're going to improve it, and we're going to keep on going. And the other thing, as you mentioned, we talked about this already. It's uh -huh. not just about robots. We're just, yeah. it's, shh, shh. <laughs> well, I can think of a bunch of applications that, yeah, okay. <laughs> very, very cool, you guys. Well, thank you for having us. Uh, for thank you. Great to meet thank you. you. We will visit you guys again. Absolutely. And, uh, You're welcome back. See what kind of feedback you've had. Sounds great. And uh, maybe we can uh, we'll, we'll do this and, again. Yeah, we'll see some more uh, robots, maybe. I hope so. Maybe we'll see some, yeah, definitely. A robot wars next time. <laughs> yes. They'll be peaceful robots. Hopefully. Yes. All right.